It's really an honor to have you with us. So we've got Rachel with us, Adam and Mia, who are going to share how SF questions are impacted in our brains and how we can use this in organizations and in the work that we do. And the uh, SFIO is really dedicated to connecting practitioners from across the world to learn and evolve our practice together. So this is another one of these beautiful opportunities to do that. And I wish you a wonderful, wonderful session. We're honored to have you with us. Welcome and Rachel, if you wanna kick off. Thank Thanks you, Annie. Thank you so much for inviting us. And it's just so lovely to see so many people here. So thank you for joining us today wanted to start I guess by just introducing ourselves uh, we'll come to me and Adam in a second um, we set up the center for solution focused research to coordinate research activities that we bring uh, looking into the neuroscience of solution focused practice my background I'm a psychologist I was in academia for 20 something years and um, I'm now in private practice but maintaining a research profile and a teaching profile as well. And I got interested in the use of EEG, which is electroencephalogram, so electrical activity of the brain measuring, um, about five years ago. And really got interested in seeing what happens in the brain during different elements of a, a therapy session. And in fact, I actually started looking at this, seeing what happened in the brain during hypnotic trance. And when I presented those findings, uh, I think, Mia, you got in touch. So Mia, we'll go to you next. <laughs> <laughs> well, my background is in, um, in social work and uh, family support work in high-risk families. So I'm, I'm a practitioner, not, not, um, not a scientist, uh, but I got inspired by Adam years and years back. Uh, when he was teaching me about neuroscience and, and how the brain works. And um, I just find it really interesting. So my, my aim was to A, bring Adam and Rachel together and to, to learn from them because I could, I could take all the evidence or all the knowledge from them with me and use it actively in my work doing family support work in high-risk families, but also in, in staff because I work in an organization which Pia started, she's here today, uh, she decided to create uh, an organization where we only do solution-focused work. So with staff and with clients, so the whole way around. So this was a perfect way for me to get more knowledge that I could use more actively in my day-to-day -day work. So, so thanks to Adam for starting, kickstarting that thing in, in my brain. <laughs> And over to you, Adam. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be here. It's nice to see many familiar faces. So this is not this is not my typical arena, but it's it's nice to see people that I typically see in a different arena. Um, yeah. So my name is Adam Froer, and I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. And um, I work. Um, with Elliot Connie at the Solution Focus Universe. Uh, my role there is um, as the director of research and training. Um, and so obviously doing research with Rachel and Mia is up in the alley of what it is I'm supposed to be doing in my job. Um, and so, um, yeah, M Mia, I think was the um, key to linking all of us together. Um, and we um, watched Rachel's presentation um, and really that kind of sparked um, how it is that we got to this project that we're going to talk a little bit about today as well. Um, and we just kind of started thinking, um, how does solution focus brief therapy impact um, what's going on for people? Um, particularly in the brain um, while they're receiving therapy. So we're going to talk a little bit about a, a study that we're doing now. Um, but one of the things I think that we had to grapple with as we were um, 
as we were kind of designing this study is, well, a couple of things we had to grapple with is how are we going to do this internationally, um, which has been a bit of a feat, but I think it's going well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I also, one of the things that we had to grapple with is um, what did we really care about? What did we, what did we want to know? Um, and for those of you who do research, you know, you typically start with some kind of a research question. What are you trying to figure out? Um, and I think we had to kind of expand um, our perspective a bit um, because we know a lot about solution-focused brief therapy, but we don't know a lot about what happens in the midst of receiving solution-focused therapy. Um, and so that's where we kind of had to begin kind of our investigation to say, um, how do we even and begin to pull apart the process, what's happening during this process. Um, and it's been, it's been really fascinating to kind of get to see that for, I would say probably the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we're excited to share with you some of the things, some of the preliminary things that we're discovering. Fabulous. And what we've found um, while we were talking together and kind of thinking about the work that we wanted to do was that we were interested in kind of what is it about solution-focused conversation that makes a difference. Mm. When I started doing the research into the neuroscience of kind of different types of therapies, I was really inspired by what happened when the suggestion of change, change is possible, change could happen, started to occur in the session. And when I started looking at this research, um, I mentioned hypnotic trance. We used a lot of solution-focused suggestions whilst uh, people were in hypnotic trance to see how their brains engaged with it. Now, one of the reasons we did that is because when you're in hypnotic trance, you don't move a lot. And the kit that we use to measure what's going on in the brain is sensitive to movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really helpful to kind of get quite a clean data set from people who are very comfortably relaxed, sitting back and hearing questions and formulating their responses to it without the messiness of opening their mouths and making movements, <laughs> which um, can complicate things when you're using EEG. But what I noticed during the trance phase was that when we use metaphor, when we propose change as possible, change is something that could happen for you. The person started to invoke what we call the creativity processes, the creative thinking processes in the brain. And we could actually track in the brain from when the person heard the suggestion that change was possible and then started to put it into, um, into place, this idea that change was possible. Now, everybody we worked with who was in trance had had a solution focused session beforehand. So we've already done a bit of preferred future type work with them. So they were already started on this, on this journey, if you like, towards I could do these things differently. So when they heard the kind of messages again, it was as if the person just grabbed that idea of I could make this change and off it goes. Now, how do I know that the creative thinking process was happening for people. If I can share a couple of pictures with you, I'll share um, an image of the brain. I will just um, try and make that into a slideshow. There we go. We've got on your screen here two oh, images of the brain. And what we've got is the brain on the right. You can see there's colored dots and lines. And um, for those of you who see uh, in color, those are kind of a bright blue color. 
and they're very vertically orientated. You can see that um, the activity of thinking through a solution for this person is very vertical in the kind of parietal temporal areas of the brain. Now the brain on the left hand side uh, shows much more kind of horizontal connectivity there. So you've got reddish dots, red lines there uh, operating in a kind of left right direction, a horizontal direction. And so the person here is using much more of the frontal cortex in coming up with their solution to the question they've been asked. The brain on the right is considered a less creative brain. The person is relying on tried and trust, trusted methods to answer the problem. The brain on the left with the horizontal activity is considered a more creative brain and that this person is reaching into the great library of the frontal cortex to find new ways of seeing things, new ways of doing things. And knowing that this is how the brain operates in a creative and a less creative um, context, I knew that during the kind of idea of change is possible conversation, I could see the activity of the person that we were looking at going from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. So they were using that horizontal network rather than simply focusing up down on the sort of left parietal area. So I could actually see that people were using much more of the brain, if you like, when they were thinking of the answer to their question because they were delving deeper into the frontal cortex. And when you look at that on EEG, you can li quite literally see process question, start to generate answer activity in the front. Now, what was really exciting is that the activity didn't just stay on the left-hand side of the brain. So left-hand side of the brain was doing a lot of work, but as the person started to come up with an answer, they started showing activity in the right frontal cortex of the brain. And so we started to see an almost kind of ping pong effect of left, right, left, right across the frontal cortex of the brain. And what was happening there is that the left frontal cortex was coming up with an idea, it was generating an idea, and it was sending it across to the right side of the brain for evaluation, is this idea of any use to me right now? And of course the brain was testing many, many options. And while it was doing that, you could see a lot of activity at the front of the brain, pulsing away left, right, left, right, as the brain was trying to work out which answer it wanted. Then when it found the answer it wanted, you saw activity in what they call the eureka part of the brain the bit that goes, ah, I've got it. And so you see this kind of right prefrontal coming out of a huge burst of activity, of excitement, and then the person has their answer. And this was so extraordinarily exciting to be able to see that the way that we were communicating with somebody was encouraging this beautiful, creative way of thinking. Now, of course, everyone said to me, yeah, that's great, but not many people use hypnosis. What if we don't? What happens when we're talking to people? And I was like, people are messy. They move their mouths when they talk. You know, they move around in their chair. That disrupts the EEG. We can't have that. But we could. We found a way to collect the information with humans that aren't pinned down into their chair, that aren't, haven't got their heads stabilized, they're in a natural position to be able to talk. And so we put together a research project and got ethical approval through the University of Gloucestershire. They host um, the ethical approval for this because we're all now in private practice. We're not in universities anymore. And Adam and Elliot were able first to start collecting data. 
Adam, would you like to now talk about, I guess, the protocol that you, you followed in the States? Yeah, yes. so, so we um, are working with um, uh, a university here, um, Mercer University, and we use their clinic space. Um, and one of the benefits of that clinic space is um, they have things like one-way mirrors and they have really open spaces. Um, so I'll tell you just a little bit about like how we're beginning to collect this data. Um, we have um, we have kind of organized for those of you who um, who don't know, um, or I guess maybe some of you who are familiar, Elliot and I have kind of recently talked about the diamond approach to solution focused therapy. And um, really, it's supposed to not necessarily create anything new or different for solution folks brief therapy, but in some sense to kind of just create a roadmap to say, this is this is kind of what's happening um, in a solution focused session. And you can see here, here's a, an image of the most recent um, version of the diamond. In essence, down that left side column is kind of three main tasks that are happening during a solution focused session. One, you get the client's desired outcome, where they're hoping to go. Um, the second part of that process is you get a description. There's poss multiple possible ways of getting a description. Um, we, um, when we started this protocol, we actually on this diamond had four, um, four different types of description. Um, so you have those three that are there, but we also had a fourth, which was scaling, um, which is important because that has impacted the research design. Um, and so we, in essence, we're saying, think, keeping in mind all the things that Rachel just told you about creativity, right? In some sense, we wanted to say, um, are people who are capable of creativity or people who consider themselves creative kind of people, are they, are they better suited for having solution focused conversations? Are they better suited to have certain kinds of conversations? Um, and so what we were looking at specifically is could if we could have a session that was just specific to one type of description. So if a client came in and we only did resource talk with that person, would that, would that change what happened during the brain? Um, would that change that creativity process that Rachel just talked to you about? Similarly, right, if we had another client come in and they only had a preferred future kind of conversation, would that change, again, what we could see, what we would notice during that time and so on through the history of the outcome and through the scaling questions? So we randomized um, which clients got which one of these types of description. So clients would come in um, and I would meet with them. Um, we would give them a couple of measures. We would give them um, the GAD7, which is a generalized anxiety disorder measure. And we would also give them um, the PHQ-9, um, which is a, a depression inventory. And the reason that we chose to do those two things, even though we wouldn't necessarily say that they're solution focused in any way, is that we wanted to just test their general mental health, right? We wanted to make sure um, that we understood that potentially there could be confounding variables there, that if somebody was experiencing anxiety or depression, perhaps that would change what we would see in their brain. So we did those things to kind of get a baseline. Um, and then in addition to that, we would give them just a general demographic questionnaire. Um, as part of that general demographic questionnaire, there was also um, a couple of questions that were specific to creativity. Um, there were some, um, one question just asked, do you consider yourself a creative person? Um, another, another couple of questions were, um, in essence, to kind of test their creativity. And these were um, questions, really simple questions, like please list as many uses for a brick as you can come up with, right? And um, people who tend to have really concrete thinking, they say you can use a brick to build things. You can um, throw a brick. You can, you know, and then people who tend to be more creative come up with out of the box um, 
ideas of what you could use a brick for, potentially a paperweight or potentially a, an art design on a shelf or, you know, so all of a sudden the things that they're using a brick for um, become more creative. And th that helped us to kind of understand, again, a baseline um, of creative thinking. So there were a few other questions that we included there. Once they would um, answer those are preliminary questions, we would then take them into a therapy room. Um, at that point, um, we would put the EEG headset onto their heads. And this is what the EEG headset looks like. Um, you can see that on each side, so it mirrored, the two sides are mirror images of each other. And you can see on each half of the brain, there are seven different sensors, four in the front, three in the back. And they just, and they, um, they just kind of sit on top of someone's head. They're not attached in any way, um, but they are moist. We put um, some saline on them in order to increase the electi electricity con conductivity. Um, and so we would put this on and we would then do a series of, again, baseline um, activities, right? So we would have them sit quietly with their eyes open for one minute and we would watch their brain to see what happens during that time. We would have them sit quietly with their eyes closed and we would watch what would happen um, to their brain at, during that time. And we would make sure that it was getting a reading on all 14 of those different sensors. So we can see kind of what's happening in all the different regions of the brain. Um, this, was a, <laughs> this was a time where there was a lot of trial and error, right? So we had to, each person had to make sure that it fit comfortably. Some people that we're asking them now to wear this on their head for an entire hour while they get um, a solution focused session. Um, we could see as well, just so you can kind of know like what we're looking at during this time, we had two kind of different images before us. Um, on the left hand screen, um, it was a list of those 14 different nodes. And then we would, we could see kind of like if you've ever seen like a heart monitor, right, it kind of goes up and down. We could see that up and down for each one of the 14 points. Um, and so we could we could watch in real time. Oh, perfect. So here you are, the, all of these different colored lines, um, they, they correspond each one of those to one of those sensors on their brain. So then as the person is talking, then you can see the different parts of the brain that are active. And then on the right hand side of the screen, then you can see the other image. And this image shows the different kinds of brain waves um, that are present um, while the conversation is happening. In addition, you can see where this, um, where this uh, act, brain activity is happening. So if you look here, if you, you may notice in the top right corner, that's me wearing the headset. Um, so this is literally a picture of my brain. Um, and Rachel and Mia give me a hard time because there's all this activity happening on the left side of the brain and almost nothing happening on the right side of the brain. Um, so I'm basically half brain dead is what we have determined. Um, but you can see in this, that, that description that Rachel shared with you about that brain activity, right? It's starting in the back and moving up to the front. You can see all of that happening on the left side of my brain, right? And then you can see like what she talked about, then it moves over to the right frontal part of the brain and you can see that little blurb of color there. The different colors, the blue, the purple, um, there should be some red in there, like pinkish red. I don't have much of that going on either. So you can make whatever. Those are the different kinds of brain waves, right? So alpha, beta, delta, gamma, um, and we're, or theta, sorry. Um, and we're actually looking predominantly when you're looking for creativity, you're really looking for um, alpha and theta waves. Um, and so we're looking for certain colors to kind of be showing up here to say, is, is creativity um, happening, right? So we can see each one of those nodes and what's happening in each of those spots, but then we can watch the overall process of where it is in the brain and what type of brain wave is going on. Um, so that was kind of a detour, but we put the headset on, we kind of get a reading to see, is this making sense? 
Then I would leave the room after I would get this all attached to their head. And at that point, and only at that point, would I tell Elliot what kind of session he needed to do, right? So we had predetermined, we had randomized one of those four types of sessions. And then we would say, so I would say to him, okay, on this session, you have to do just a preferred future conversation. So he would start and he would get the desired outcome and then he would move into a preferred future description. Um, or I would say, you know, on this one, you can only do resource talk. And so he would spend that session doing a resource talk conversation. And again, one of the things that we were looking for is, are there differences in what happens in someone's brain based on the kind of description that they're doing? Um, and so that helped us to kind of understand what might be going on, what, what kind of creativity are we in, tapping into as we do these kinds of conversations. And as you think about it, let me give you a little bit of explanation for why we might be interested in creativity, right? If you think, let's just take for a second the preferred future um, kind of description, right? We're in some sense asking people to project forward to a time that has not happened yet. And we're asking them to describe if, if your best hopes showed up, what would life be like? Who would notice? right? What would they notice? What would be different about the things that you do and how you live your life? And, right? and so they have to hypothetically create a description um, of something that hasn't happened yet. And that would require some level of creativity. right? So part of the question that we're wondering is, is are creative people better at engaging in those types of conversations? right? And potentially you think about um, like a history of the outcome, right? If we go back into the past and we say, are there times where your desired outcome has been present before, right? And, in, at, and on the surface level, then you might be thinking to yourself, well, that would require less creativity because that's really just memory, right? Like I'm just remembering what has already happened. But one of the things actually that we know is that um, memory doesn't get stored in concrete details, right? It's not a black and white representation of what actually happened. Um, the, our long-term memory works in tandem with our working memory, which means that whatever's going on in our lives right this moment, it influences the way that we remember something, right? If I'm in a particularly good time in my life, I might have a, a bit of a positive slant to the things that I remember. Or I might say, you know, even though that, ha that, that hard thing happened, there was some meaning in that hard thing that has helped me to get to the place that I am right now. Or if I'm in a particularly bad place in my life, I might go back and remember that in a slightly different way. And I might really kind of emphasize the difficulty that I was going through at that time, right? So, what we know is that working memory, our current experience, really does impact how we remember things. And you probably all have experienced this at least a little bit because you probably told people about an experience that has happened to you previously, right? And you've probably told the same story to multiple different people. And you probably have noticed that each time you tell that story, you emphasize different things or you remember certain details or you highlight certain things, right? So the recounting of that story is different each time. And that kind of highlights that connection between that working memory and the long-term memory, right? And one of the things that we also know is that working memory is really also dependent on creativity, right? That if I'm going to use that working memory to go back into the past and pull those memories, I'm going to have to, in some sense, recreate them, right? And you hear that word recreate. There's creativity that is required. It's not necessary that, we're re that we are recalling them. It is that we are recreating them. Um, and so we should still see, even in a history of the outcome description, we should still see the, create, the creative process happening, um, right? Where you get to 
some of the, the other like scaling questions, right? And a whole scaling description. What number are you at now? What number would you be at then? What number were you at back then? You can hear because of the things that we've already talked about that if I project forward and say, what number would you be at? And what would be different to you if you were at that number? Or if I go back, what number were you at, at in previous times, right? Again, there would be a creative process that should potentially be involved in that description. So in some sense, we wanted to say, does that actually hold true? Are people who are engaged in these kinds of conversations, are they more successful at these conversations if they can engage that creative process in their brain? Um, so I would tell Elliot at that time, you have to do this certain kind of conversation and you can't deviate, right? Um, and so he would go in and do a session for, usually, usually the sessions would last between 30 and 45 minutes. Um, and we saw all of the things that Rachel mentioned, that people are messy and that they move and that their, their brains are active, right? But one of the things that we were kind of surprised at is that that movement didn't necessarily seem to interrupt the data collection. We could still see all of the 14 nodes moving. Um, we could also see the brain activity happening. And so we were pleasantly surprised and said, despite the movement, I think we're still capturing what we're hoping to capture here. Um, at that point, at the end of the solution-focused session, Elliot would leave the room and I would go back into the room. And at that point, we would take the headset off because by this point, they've been wearing it for an hour and sometimes it's uncomfortable. And there were always those one or two people who would get uncomfortable and then start moving it and then it would mess up our results. Um, so we really did at times want to, you know, make people sit on their hands or tie their hands down and be like, please don't touch that thing that's really uncomfortable that we put on your head. Um, and so at that point, then I would go in and I would do what we call the post, um, the post session interview. And this was just a qualitative interview um, with really open ended questions. And what we were trying to get at here is to understand um, their experience of the process. So what was it like to wear that on your head? What would what was it like to go through this kind of therapy process? Um, were there particular kinds of questions that you liked? Were there particular kinds of questions that you didn't like? Um, were there some questions that were easier to answer than other kinds of questions? Um, and so we just were trying to get their qualitative experience, again, about the process of the session and, and what it was like. Both the solution-focused session, but also the EEG data collection process. So we were trying to get information about both of those processes. Um, so that was kind of how we would conduct from beginning to end, how we would gather this information. Um, so and then it, it changed a little in the UK. I haven't told yeah. you this. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we were fortunate in that uh, data collection started in the US. Um, we were still under COVID restrictions for uh, research in the UK until quite recently. Um, but yeah, so then we started the work in the UK. And in fact, the picture there of the lady wearing the, the kit was collected um, in the UK. We had a few few issues um, with our weekend of data collection. We, we wanted uh, an independent therapist. The independent therapist had to pull out, unfortunately, uh, just before. We wanted a lab that had good connectivity for the full three days, but the university decided to upgrade all the software and internet and stuff on the third day. Um, so we had access to nothing. Uh, let me think what else happened. Uh, it, it, it was all over the place, but we did it. We still managed to do our study with a couple of slight changes. And actually, I think um, the changes add interest to the study rather than detract from it. So we had, uh, I think, Adam, you had five participants in that first round. Yeah, we had five, too, uh, in our weekend. They all completed the same measures. So they did the GAD7, the PHQ9. 
um, we put on the kit and uh, we, uh, you know, did the eyes shut, eyes open kind of work. The reason we do the eyes open, eyes shut is because when you shut your eyes, there's an instant boost of alpha brain waves. So having um, somebody just sit for a minute, uh, maybe 30 seconds, I can't remember, it's not very long, eyes open, we get what we call baseline data for that person, eyes open being alert. Then with eyes shut, their brain waves change, produce a lot more alpha. So again, we get a second baseline of brain activity with eyes shut, which means that we can then extract that information from the data and just simply see what was changing as a result of what the person was doing, in this case, answering questions, thinking through the session, um, rather than we're just collecting data like when they blink, alpha changes, if they shut their eyes for a moment or look away, things like that. So we've got that baseline data that we can then extract and just look at the change data uh, for all of our participants. Richard, could you maybe just brief say what alpha is? Yes. Well, you wrote it down, Mia. Would you like to do? <laughs> It'll be a copy of what you've taught them. <laughs> what is, it's about people seeing things happening, right? So they're imagining things in their brain. Um, yeah. The good waves, the ones we want. That's the purple it. ones that we saw on the video of Adam's brain. Yeah, the purple ones. So yeah, totally. Alpha brain waves. Uh, the brain waves are named in order of discovery, which is really annoying if you're trying to learn them for an exam because they're not in order of you know, magnitude or anything useful like that. So they come in order of discovery. Alpha, the first brain wave to be recorded, uh, recorded in I think around the 1910s, 1920s. And that brain wave is unique in that it originates from an area of the brain called the occipital lobe. And that's the bit of the brain behind the lumpy bits of your skull, right at the back there. The brain waves originate from there and travel forward. Alpha brain waves associated with feeling good. Um, they're in this part of the brain, which is also where visual processing happens. And so when you ask uh, somebody a question and they kind of look away as they're formulating the answer, they are seeing themselves in that situation. They're producing a ton of alpha in order to enable that process. So that alpha brain wave is related to visualization, feeling good, feeling in control, things are going well, it's all a really good place to be, alpha. So, and interestingly, yes, you get a boost of it when you shut your eyes, not long you shut your eyes before your brain starts generating images. It doesn't really like to not be doing anything in your brain. And so once it's not getting visual stimuli, it will start generating its own. So that's alpha. We want to see lots of alpha in our participants because that shows to us that they're comfortable, they're happy doing what they're doing, but they're also visualizing, they're imagining themselves in that situation. They are reflecting on a previous example of something similar to what they're going through right now. How did I cope back then? And I'm thinking about it. So we're looking to see turn of alpha. The next one, beta. So alpha is about eight to 12 hertz. Beta is very fast. And so that is faster than 12, so kind of 13 plus. And you will see a lot of beta in people who are busy doing, call it busy beta. So they're busy doing. Um, highly anxious people produce a ton of beta, can make it very difficult for them to actually kind of settle into the session. You know, they arrive and they're quite flustered. They're quite kind of on edge and they're producing a lot of beta. Beta is useful. It helps you catch a frisbee, stop a child from running across the road, you know, stop your mug from falling off the coffee table. Beta is really handy and totally useful if you're into puzzles and quiz games, things like that. Um, too much of it is draining. It's exhausting. So we'd like to see beta kind of drop off a little bit 
during the session as the person becomes more familiar and comfortable working with us. The next brainwave, theta, is slower than alpha, so that's kind of four to eight hertz. Theta is a lovely big fat wave of energy running through your brain. It's associated with meditative states, hypnosis states, mindfulness, creativity, which is the exciting one. We want to see a lot of theta in people who are being asked to come up with a new way of doing things. And the theta activity is something that we're really looking for as part of the bigger picture of what's happening in the brain during a solution focused session. It should indicate that they're comfortable, that they are putting things together in a different way. Um, and interestingly, thinking that my research started in the hypnosis kind of field, what is a hypnotic trance? You know, it's where conscious and subconscious are connected and talking to each other in preferred future, which was perhaps my thinking with some of this, is the person engaging in almost a meditative state as they go through the work of a preferred future or miracle question because they're being asked to suspend reality perhaps for a moment to see themselves perhaps being a four rather than a three. So be able to take a step out of all the stuff that's on their minds right now. So will we see a lot of theta during that process? And then there are two others, delta, deep sleep delta, lovely, really, truly big fat waves, relaxing, show it during sleep, show it in deep trance, deep meditative states. Um, people who practice a lot of yoga, Pilates, that kind of work, will probably start to show a lot of delta at that stage. In the images that uh, we can see with Adam, and we've got some recorded so we can show you some of the sort of real time brain activity going on during a session, um, we're actually looking at gamma. And gamma is the fastest of the brain waves that we have. And we're still learning a lot about it. We're still learning a lot about gamma. But it's, it's a connecting brain wave. It kind of enables processes to happen in the brain, it seems. Um, it seems to be one of those brain waves that enables um, motor activity so to open your hand, close your hand, you can do some quick gamma in order to activate the parts of the brain that require you to do that to then activate your body to be able to open and close your hand. So gamma is one of those kind of activating brain waves. And we will see a lot of that because we're requiring a person to do a lot of activity whilst we're talking with them. Did I get it right, Mia? Absolutely. <laughs> Got an A plus there. <laughs> and they do have different colors <laughs> on the software, obviously. Um, purple is alpha, beta blue, pink is beta and red is gamma, but we'll have a look at that in a bit. So questions, I think at this point, oh, and I was going to say about slight differences in the way that we conducted our sessions in the UK. Um, Rather than solely focus the session just on one route through the diamond model, we actually ran uh, what you might call a natural solution focused therapy session. So it included questions around scaling, it included questions around resource talk, it included questions around preferred future. But we have a note of when the questions were asked and what question was asked. So we'll be able to distinguish what's happening in those times. But that was simply a function of the way that the weekend went at the time. So we will have sessions recorded, which are purely focusing on one route through the diamond. And then we'll have recordings of a session that dips into each element of the diamond. So we kind of went to study three in our weekend of data collection. <laughs> So yeah, thoughts so far on what we're doing. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> you can probably tell we're a little bit enthusiastic about it. 
can I jump in? Because I usually yeah, do that. Yeah, I sh- Everyone knows I'm the one that jumps in. I, I, you know what, you know how I feel about this. It's absolutely fascinating and I can't wear to wear one of them one day. Mm-hmm. Hint, hint. Um, but also for, for me, selfishly, selfishly speaking, it's, um, it's an amazing study to show funders. It's an amazing study to say, actually, this is when they, when, cause I do ask the question, how do you know what you do works? Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, we do the scaling and we do everything else and we check in with them every six months, uh, you know, three months and six months. But actually to have this there <clears throat> and to say, actually, it has been tried and tested. They have done this study. This is the outcome of the study. This is why. And this, um, what we're doing, this just proves it over and over again. So selfishly speaking, you're helping us. Thank you. <laughs> That's our plan. <laughs> Can I jump in as well, right? And uh, I should have to fight you for that place to have wear one of those head things because... Uh, <laughs> I want, I want to wear one of those as well. Maybe we could do a joint thing. But I've always, always been fascinated by how the brain works and just listening to how it reacts to those solution-focused questions. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing how the patterns vary throughout from the scaling to the, to the best hopes. And I, I've seen the FBS chat that you guys have done as well which showed the different parts representing the brain and i mean the moment aisha said there's a brain thing with rachel killer i just said yes put me on it don't <laughs> care coming from the other side of like you guys out in the field having to get sponsors in or get you know clients into the business or work and working with other clients um this is this is brilliant evidence you know because we're finding really interesting things like we're, we're actually getting physical evidence of what that the, the brain is producing an answer even before the client answers, you know. So all these, mm-hmm. I'm sure most of you have, have met other people who are not in the SF way of thinking and they go, well, well, how do you know? You know, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a bit wifty wafty, whatever. There's a lot of words to this, but we actually see now that the seconds before an answer comes out of the mouth of someone with the headset on, there's so much activity going on, and I'm there. You know, all the purples and all the <laughs> all the blue <laughs> ones <laughs> are are working really hard. Which which is, uh, you know, we're starting to see something that we for many many years have had, and don't you know? Some might hit me very hard now. We have, we've had an assumption and we've based our, our evidence on, on what we've seen and a fair amount of assumptions that that must be happening because we're seeing this change in people. But we're seeing that, you know, if a client says, I don't know, they do know because we can measure that on the brain now and we can see that. So they do know, you know, mm-hmm. so I think this is, this is absolutely fantastic for our, our selling of, of this way of working with people. Um, because we live in a world, you know, you're all in organizations and, and a lot of you are also self-employed. We need to have, you know, um, scientific evidence in order to get to get funds and people to take this very serious. Yeah. I, I, have a, I have a question. I have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have a few um, actually, questions. Actually, I want to, I I, first of all, this is very exciting. I And kind of picking up on whoever is FBS, uh, at her, her chat just now, mm-hmm. has there been any thought of doing this with other models, say CBT or <laughs> of psychoanalytic psychotherapy yeah. or, you know, any of the other 500 yeah. different models out there and what that might produce in terms of comparison with solution focused sessions? Uh, yes. You know, we, we're asked this question a lot and um, also kind of touching on the, the chat there, people saying, what about with this? What about with this? What about with that? Um, yes, 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 yes. Um, we have a way to go. You know, we have a way to go because we didn't anticipate the last two years holding us up quite so, but, you know, that happened. What we're doing with this study somebody asked the question around neurodiversity or people who are limited in their ability to uh, produce visual images or an internal voice. We 
have only screened for active psychosis and certain psychosis medications. People come to us as they are. And that was really important. Yeah, Adam, do you want to kind of? We were just gonna, we also did screen for um, people who were taking epilepsy medication. Yes. Because that, that can also affect that your affect the... brain. So that is one area where we did make sure. Yeah. So we, we've really screened for very, very limited situations with people. So people are coming to us as they are mm -hmm. with everything that a, a typical person brings. And so our study, because we're looking at the neural pathways, we're able to see which systems are activated during certain questions. The more data we collect, the more we're gonna be able to um, produce a, a strongly convincing argument that this is a therapy that can be used with the person who walks through the door. Mm -hmm. And this was key to us. We wanted to meet the person, not the problem. We didn't collect a lot of data on, um, you know, are you on the autism spectrum? Do you have ADHD? Do you have dyslexia? Do you have, you know, we didn't collect that. These are people who wanted to have a session with us and we collect the data on the person who wants to have a session with us. Now, there may of course be differences and people, we have the opportunity uh, the option to go back to somebody and say, just wanted to, you know, uh, check in with this or that, you know, give them a view. Because the way that solution focused therapy works from my perspective, and I know everybody has different perspectives on this, but from my perspective, I want to know what the person wants help with, you know, what they want to change today, what it is they want to work with today. I don't go through a seven page document of, have you got this? Have you got that? Have you got, you know, the other? I don't do that. And I wanted the research to reflect the experience of the average person who walks in through the door. We have a broad range of ages. Mm -hmm. We even have male participants. And those of you who've done research know how hard that is to get male <laughs> participants. We have men as well as women. We have people who identify um, differently to others. We have all of that represented, but we still only have one mm. Adam. I think the other thing that's um, important to point out, I think, yes, we absolutely want to get to a place where we're comparing our results to other people's mm -hmm. results. But I also think, but I also think it's really important to note at this time, this isn't just like state of the art research in solution focused therapy. This is this is state of the art research in psychotherapy in general. Okay. I don't when we were when we were looking for other research on other approaches and what do they know about this process? In essence, we came up with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so there isn't when we would love to make a comparison, right? And, and the easiest way to make the comparison is what have other people already found and how do we compare to it? But that doesn't exist either. Um, and so, so it might be a while until we can get there because the other part of this is um, it's, it's difficult to get someone um, to be willing to do therapy in person, right? Both a clinician and a client. Mm. And then to record it and then to do the research on it, it, we're asking both the clinician and the client for a very hefty contribution. Mm. Um, and so it, it might take us a while just mm. to get data in the solution focused world, um, but it'll definitely take us longer um, because, because I think when you look in, at what sessions are available, um, solution-focused therapists are, it seems, more, more willing to let their work be watched. Um, and and it's, it'll be difficult for us to get an, an equal comparison um, because we, it, it's asking both people to contribute a lot. Um, it is. We have two Rachel, questions um, that are... I, we do, I just see that we have some two questions. Yeah, we do, yeah. And then, yeah, maybe John, you want to start? Uh, yeah, my, my, my question really is, is because you're talking about other strands of you know, different um, 
approaches, as it were, CBT or whatever. Um, and what I'm really interested in, which is a much simpler uh, comparison to make, which I, I should actually uh, refer to as well, is what happens when you ask a problem focus question and, and do you have that? Because when we work in organizations, it's the big, you know, that's the big area. It's, it's well, we've been fine with problem focus questions analysis for a long time. Uh, you know, what is there that we could perhaps show them to say something different happens? Yeah, I think, yeah, you know, it is, um, it is a study that can be done. It is a study that can be done. And I, you know, we don't want to make too many excuses for what we have done, what we haven't done. It's just taken so long to even get permission to do this in COVID restrictions, in you know, getting access to the environment in which to do it. Adam and I have both had to kind of use our connections to get the facilities to to conduct the studies in, you know, and to get that two-way mirror room with the recording facilities. You know, we, we are um, handing out a lot of biscuits or cookies for those of you who don't have seven different biscuits. This is how we bribe academics to support our work. Um, tea and biscuits in the UK, coffee and cookies, I think, in the US. But, uh, you know, we are relying on everyone's goodwill at the moment. It's not a funded research programme. So. Um, I have a question for Rachel. One second. Um, oh, just a second. Um, we have yeah. Alex as well, I think. Oh. Exactly. We'll start with Alex and then you're good. You're okay, coming. thank you. Yeah. Come on in. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so thank you to, to, to all, all three of you for your brilliant um, presentation. And uh, I'm very intrigued. I was just curious. Obviously, you've explained the, um, the 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 research objectives and the methodology and so on. But in terms of the findings, well, I've got a second question, which is, uh, have you published what are they? The, the, the findings <laughs> yet? But the first question it was simply about you talk spoke about the the looking at some some groups around resource talk and some around preferred future, and. Um, I was intrigued to know what what was the difference in terms of what you saw in the brain. I don't know if you've already said that, but yeah. tell me again if you have. What was the difference? Because so, that's a big thing yeah. for, for me. So the data is now gone. So the way that we're running this project is that um, there are elements of separation within it so that we have people who are looking at the data who weren't part of the data collection process. And the reason for that is to get an independent eye on the data to tell us what they see. Because when we look at it, we know what we want to see. So the data is um, with uh, Professor Graham Edgar at the moment at the University of Gloucestershire and Dr. Steve Baker. Um, you know, they're currently marking papers at the moment, um, but they will be able to look at it into for when we um, present this more fully, hopefully in June. But what they're going to look at is the gap between the end of the question and the beginning of the answer. So they're going to look at that second worth of data all the way through what's going on, because what they're interested in is seeing what happens between hearing and understanding the question and formulating your answer. Hey, Google, stop. So um, they're looking to find out um, that snapshot of activity in the brain for all of the people who've taken part, for all of the gaps between all of the questions and all of the answers, to see whether the particular question stimulates the creativity pathway, whether it does it differently, whether there are different areas of the brain activated, and the kind of um, analysis we're asking them to do is apparently quite tricky. So it's going to take a lot of biscuits, but we're going to get there. And Alex, you're in Cheltenham, you know, they're just up the road from you, Francis Close Hall. <laughs> I worked there for 15 years at Francis Close Hall. Ah, I was there for two. <laughs> I'll talk to you about that later. But thank you. So, so basically, you're yeah, saying so, it's ongoing. And yeah. so, it is and totally it's, ongoing. Yeah, We've got yeah. another study to come, another study to come. Would anybody like to see a little bit of brain? Can, can I just, can I just add yes, two Alan. things? Yes. Can I just add two things really quickly? So I think one of the things also about that, like the degrees of separation that Rachel was talking about, 
the the researchers who are looking at the the brain waves, the brain information, they are actually completely unfamiliar with solution focused brief therapy. They don't they don't know anything about it, which I think is also something that really strengthens this study, right? Some might argue that because we had clinicians who were um, you know, experts of solution focused therapy, they would they would pursue a certain course of of process, right? And in some sense, we want that to be the case, right? We want we want these to be the very best solution focused sessions that we can get. And so we tried really hard to find the clinicians who would help us get that information. But then when it came to reading the the brain activity, we wanted some we wanted people who were completely unfamiliar with solution focused brief therapy so that they aren't biased in looking for any particular thing. They're going to just say this is what we see. Um, so I think that's important to note. The other thing that I would say is anecdotally in that time in between the end of the question and the beginning of the answer, the, one of the reasons that we're looking at that came almost inductively mm -hmm. as, as we were watching, right? So we went, we didn't go into it trying to find any particular answer because we don't, because this is the first of its kind, we don't know what we're looking for. And so it had to kind of develop inductively. And one of the things that that I noticed as I was watching from behind, right? There was one particular session um, where um, it was a resource talk session. And at the beginning of the session, I thought, how is he going to do an entire session that is only resource talk, right? It's that's a, that's a tall order to ask a clinician to do. Um, and so one of the, the way that it, it kind of, again, be developed anecdotally or um, individually. And, it, and, he, and he said, can you tell me what your best hopes were? And she told him what, his best, what her best hopes were. And then he said, can you, I want to make a list of 25 qualities or skills that you already have that lets you know you could achieve that desired outcome. And I think for all of you who work in businesses, that's probably not an unusual um, ask, right? When you go into inter when you go into businesses, you might say, "Tell me twenty five things that you know about your team," right? And she she kind of had this initial like twenty five things. That's that's a lot. And so he literally had a whiteboard and started listing. He numbered one to twenty five, and he said, "What's number one?" And they got down to about 13 or 14. And she was like, uh, I don't know, I don't know. I can't come up with another one. So he kept asking questions. And one of the things that I observed as I was sitting outside white, watching all of the brain activity is that he, he asked the question. And up to this point, it was like, it became like clockwork. I could predict, I would watch him ask the question and it was like her brain would just shut off, right? And she would listen intently to the question. So all of those lines just kind of went quiet. And then he would stop asking his question and that quiet would persist for a minute. And then the activity would start going. And then it, I, could, I, could, I got to the point that I could predict when she was going to start speaking because I had I could watch the pattern and I could say now and she would begin to speak and there was there was one time again she, there were about 13 or 14 items down the list and he asked the question and the pattern persisted and then her brain went and I literally went now and she and she said nothing and then I said, wait a second, what just happened? And then she said, I don't know. And then he asked his question again. And the same thing, it was quiet for a minute. And then the activity happened. And then I went, now. And again, she said, nothing. And then I sat there and I said, like, she knows the answer. I know she knows the answer. I watched it. <laughs> and then she said, I don't know. And a third time he asked the question and on the third time the activity happened and then she said, I can't think of the right word. Hmm. 
And he said, well, take your best guess. And then she gave the right word. So sitting behind the mirror, I was like, she knows the answer. The pattern exists. I can see she should have spoken and she didn't. But she was struggling to get just the right word for what she wanted to say. And I think, I think that's, that's why that process in between the, the end of the question and the beginning of the answer, that's why that pro that's, that's where this creativity process we're asking people to engage in happens. Um, and so and I, I knew, and then like Mia said, she was going to say it. <laughs> right. And like Mia said before, we, I knew she knew the answer, but what came out of her mouth was, I don't know. Yeah. And this is so useful when we're working with people, regardless in whatever setting, to know that there is an answer. There's many reasons why the answer might not come out immediately, but there is always an answer. Well, the process is happening in people's brain. Hence, we can't say that, you know, someone yeah. is not functioning well enough because we know the brain is working, even if it doesn't come out with words. It's like, I don't know yet. Yeah. I don't know how to say it. Mm. I don't know if I can trust you with this answer. I don't know that I'm ready to say that yet Jason yeah I mean I I work with teenage kids <laughs> so <laughs> the I don't know is literally common in their vocabulary mm -hmm. it is constantly being used I don't know I don't know I don't know and it's quite fascinating hearing that there is a process so I mean, <laughs> it's quite funny you say that because regardless of the I don't know, something is always happening inside the brain. And I've noticed that is when I've had the sessions where I've said to the kid when it was just literally shoulder shrugs and I don't know. And I said, okay, you don't need to tell me. I'm just being nosy. Just think about it, right? And they sat there half an hour, 40 minutes, kind of give me a, a few shoulder shrugs, silence, not really saying. I said, listen, when they're about to talk, I turn around and said, listen, I don't want to listen. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> All right. I don't want to hear it. And normally when it's an I don't know, I said, I thought you weren't going to talk. You're just going to give me an I don't know. And then they start laughing. You know. But then the following time, the, the next time I see them, they come in. And all they want to do is talk because they've noticed all the massive differences that's been happening over the course of the week or two weeks. I don't know is um, quite common in some of the sessions, isn't it, Jason? Um, and, you know, there have been times when it's like, right, three strikes and you're out of here. You get three I don't knows and then it's got to change. And then it changes to I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, <laughs> I started marking it down on the paper, right? A day to say, well, I don't know, one more time, see what happens. And they're, like, oh, they're trying to think of something else to say, is I'm not sure, or uh, we'll see. There's the other one, yeah. You know, it, it is kind of funny. I've got a little clip, um, we'll try to find a time point, um, that is with somebody doing I don't know, and you can see what happens in the brain before they say, I don't know. So you can see how much activity is going on, if that would be fun. Let's see if we can um, get it to, to show on here. Um, we've got a little annotated video um, and I need to kind of know where the time point is. It's about 13. Uh, okay, so that's just the end of one activity. So let's see. Man, that's a good looking so, thing. <laughs> If I just pause a moment, um, this is Adam and Elliot doing a conversation. Oh, now do I need to share the sound as well? I do, don't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. So if I do share again, then I need to do the advanced share sound. There we go. Um, just do I optimize she... for video? Yeah, I think yes. Well, just yep. while she's getting that ready, I just want mm -hmm. to point Thank out, you. so when she shows the video, right, the, the lines on the side, um, the two that you're really going to be paying attention to are the very top one and the very bottom one. Those are the nodes right here in the front, right, so one on each side, 
Um, and that, again, that's kind of where that eureka moment occurs, right? Where it's jumping back and forth from side to side. So that very top black line and the very bottom black line. Mm. And then you can see, again, I'm only half brained. All of those top <laughs> ones are the left brain. So you can see lots of activity happening on the left side and not quite so much, except for right here in the logical front part of my brain um, on the right side. Um, so though that's kind of how you can orient to those lines. Perfect. Uh, just uh, pop it back, I think, 10 seconds. Let's just see how it goes. And so she would know that I... So Adam's just finishing that genuine um, a little section here. Okay. So we'll move on to the next question. But, but what would she see to tell her it was genuine? I don't know. Um, What's happening? Nothing's happening? Explosions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the left side. <laughs> um, <laughs> but look, there it is over on the right. <laughs> I guess she would <laughs> she would see love in the smile, I guess. And how would she notice love? <coughs> I, knew you, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. It <laughs> what would she see in the smile that would tell her there's love in that smile? I don't know. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and all the red are all the connecting bits. Yeah. Adam's brain is connecting a lot of different places, things with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't just. Yeah. Kindness, I guess. And how would she see kindness in that smile? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it would be connected. It would be connected to my eyes, I guess. My eyes would be light. My eyes would. So it's not just the smile, but the smile would kind of be connected to my face that there would be. Yeah, there would be lightness, I guess. <laughs> You know, it um, it can just take a while to, oh, how do I get back to the thing? It's died. Computer's died. Um, the amount of activity that was happening there, Adam's going, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And yet his brain, like Mia said, the explosion of activity, he did know. Something was happening. I think it brings up a really interesting point, this thing about time, because one thing is, you know, us as um, the ones asking the questions to give the client the time to find the right answer. But working in organizations where you have you have clients, you might have big companies that are buying you in to, to do sessions with the workers, they also have uh, a limited time, they need to see some results. So how can we, you know, I find it really interesting thinking about how can we make, you know, how can we create evidence that time is necessary? Here we have evidence to show that we need time and uh, regardless what happens, development is happening in the people that we work with or in their members of staff. They have brought us in to, to do coaching or supervision or whatever with them. Um, here we have evidence that things are happening, but we as clinicians or working in organizations out there, we need to go out and find a way to make use of that <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a way that will allow you or allow us to get the time that's needed for the change, the process of change happening, because it is happening. And I think that's often a struggle. We find that anyway, we find that, that, you know, 
are the, the people paying us to, to deliver a service to them are wanting things to happen at a certain amount of time in a certain speed. I think I think but the people other... help us allow us to work with that, to talk more about speed or you work actively with the speed and tell them we need to wait and we can, you know, we can show them this. Sorry, Adam. No, 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 you're great. Um, I think I think two other things that I would point out about this process, obviously being the person who is answering those questions, I have like the inside information about like what is going on, right? Um, and I think I think two things that are important. I obviously know Elliot really, really well, right? And he knows me really well. But even even though he knew me and I know him and we're really good friends, there he was asking me a level of questions. It was like an intimate level of questions. It's a back, it's a background information. The she that I kept referring to was my wife. Right. So he's asking me, in essence, what would my wife notice? What would my wife recognize? And there's a there's a real level of intimacy there, right? He's asking me, like, what is she going to notice about your eyes? What is she going to notice about the rest of your face? And and I don't, I don't, I'm not used to to talking in that level of intimacy um, out loud to you know other people, right? And so there, so all the while all of that brain activity is happening, I am having to evaluate how much of this do I actually want him to know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, and I think that's a, I think why that's important is because it goes back to, I guess, like what Steve would say all the time, Steve DeShazer would say all the time is language creates reality, mm -hmm. right? He's asking me questions and asking me to articulate certain things, but you are watching my brain formulate language. And there was a lot more language that was happening that I heard than the language that he got to hear. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think that that's a really important thing for all of us to remember yeah. is that just because you don't get to hear the language doesn't mean the language isn't happening. Yep. So we need to ask really purposeful questions. And if we get to hear the answers, we're lucky. Mm -hmm. But we have to trust that this internal dialogue is happening, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I did know, even though I kept saying, I don't know, I don't know what she would notice. I, I did know what she would notice, yeah. but I had to put it through the filter of how much do I want you to know about what she would notice? Yeah. Um, and that's a very important And so I think point. that's... When you so I think, I think the other implication of that too is we don't know if change has happened, or I guess we do know change happened, but we don't know the implications of that change until they go live their lives as a changed person, right? Mm -hmm. I can't leave that conversation without having paid such attention to my eyes, to my mouth, to what my wife will see, what she will notice without the next time seeing her thinking, is she gonna notice all of those things? Am I gonna show her all of those things, right? So I'd, we don't know what the impact of that conversation is going to be until I go encounter the reality of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes when we get to, especially like in organizations and those kinds of things, and we say, what have you heard yourself say that's really meaningful or what stands out to you about what happened? They, they might not tell you what really stood out to them, nor will they potentially know what the implications of that conversation are until they go live their lives and encounter those details. And I think, you know, tying some of that also into the research process, you know, that image that I shared of our lovely participant wearing the headset, uh, I'll just share it again. Um, this you can see this room that we're in where she is um, having the headset put on, we're taking photographs. This is not a normal space for most people. You know, we tidied away the white lab coat, but it's still there in the back of the corner of the room. There's other EEG kits hanging up. Where I'm stood taking this picture, there's a bank of computers and technical equipment and stuff, 
you know, this was kind of like the machine room um, and the other side through that door on the other side of the mirror, we set up the therapy space for everybody. Now, does the fact that she was in this rather strange environment influence her willingness or ability to um, actually kind of share with us the um, innermost thoughts in the session that we had together? One of the things I think I said to Mia um, through the weekend was, I am in awe of how much people have trusted us during this data collection, that they have really, it felt to me, had what would be an authentic therapeutic experience mm. during this. And so we've got Adam there saying, I had to put a filter on what I wanted to say to Elliot because of the situation. I wasn't comfortable offering up the, um, the words that I might have said to somebody else. Knowing too, it's being recorded. He's got the headset on, he's got all of this. And oh, we've got hours and hours, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, with the, the people that I worked with over the weekend, we're so grateful for their generosity of time that they gave to us, but also how open they were with us during the sessions. And, you know, it would be very easy they could talk about anything they wanted to, to apply a pretty hefty filter in those sessions, knowing it's being recorded. My thoughts are that they didn't, that we did collect data in an authentic session with all of those people. And I was so proud of the people I was working with that weekend that we were able to create that environment for them, that they were able to open up and talk. Mm. And I think, you know, that is something um, that we'll hold on to through this study as well, mm. that we've been able to do that. So, spectacular timing, Annie. <laughs> I've got so many questions in my mind as well. This is fascinating. So I hope you will come back and keep sharing with us as we as you evolve in your research as well. Um, how, what we're doing stimulates a beautiful creative process, you said at one point, Rachel, and um, discovering that. Um, I'm also wondering how we can help you and potentially also as FSFIO maybe um, help you out with those cookies and tea maybe along the way so we can have that conversation as well. A wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to hearing as well more about how you're applying it in organizations, Mia, as well, and see more of the data. So any, um, as a beautiful way of closing, I think, is to write in the chat uh, what inspired you and what was very insightful for you. So if everyone wants to add that to the chat, the three of you can sit back and just enjoy reading those comments <laughs> as people slowly leave the room. So wonderful. thank you so much, Annie. It's been a wonderful experience. Yes, thank you for letting us be here. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you very much. Beautiful examples as well.